share it. So your roadmap event, is it right now it's all digital? It's all virtual. Yep. And do you miss like the in-person? I do. I think there's something powerful that happens when you're live and in person and, you know, elbow to elbow. Uh, but I, I'm amazed by how great the interaction can be these days with Zoom and people coming in from all you over the country. Great. I see. And with your, are you, you're doing the in-person though still, right? We do our member events in person. So all of our members come in and we, we spend two to three days live and in person. And then the, the roadmap live is kind of our lead up, lead up event where we're kind of explaining our entire model from the top level. Understood. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, listen, Josh, we're live. Um, I'm going to give it probably like five to 10 minutes before we kind of introduce yourself and we kind of go through with the contents that we're going to be covering. Um, so for everybody watching this video, I was able to get Josh Nelson on, which is uh, truly an honor. I think a lot of people follow you, Josh, for your, um, your strict vertical approach on the way that you do business. And I think it makes sense, right? And we're going to talk about that because I'm definitely seeking information on how you made that transition because it sounds like you had an agency prior to what you're doing now that was kind of very generalist. And so I want to get a lot into that. I want to get into why you coach and how you coach and some of the tactics that you've learned because you've been in, you've been doing agency for how long now? Uh, this will be, well, like, counting my failed agency or, or kind of like the whole, like just this particular agency, probably like 15 years. Interesting. Got it. So your failed agency, how long was that in operation for? About three, two, two and a half, three years, you know, building websites, doing hosting, never making enough money to pay the bills. Uh, about two years of beating my head against the wall. Understood. And that hecticness was when you kind of had that aha moment that you were like, I need to focus on one business or how did that mindset transition happen? I think that mindset transition happened. You know, I, I, I worked for a little bit at reach local. So I was kind of seeing that's a generalist model, right. But a very successful generalist model. And then looking at the reps that were just crushing it across the country, some of the most successful reps were niche focused. They were going with attorneys or they were going with, you know, plumbers. And I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and then as I was selling clients, I recognized they all wanted to know, like, who else did you work with like me? What experience have you had? Um, and that was kind of the, the thought process around it at the beginning. I was like, well, hey, look, if I had five or six clients in one space, it'd be so much easier to go get more because I'd be so much differently positioned. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and we're going to get really deep into that because I definitely want to learn more about how that transition happened. Your mindset, your mental health, I'm sure was just insane when you made that transition. Like right now, I can't even imagine myself making a transition like that because um, it's hard and we're going to talk about that. So you're open to talking all this stuff, Josh, right? Like nothing really. 100%. Is off Nothing's off limits, man. We go wherever, wherever you guys want. Okay, cool. So I tried to share it in your group and I did get like a automatic like flag um, inside of your group. I just text, I just sent you the link. I, I don't know if you could like approve it or something. Let me uh, pull that up. Yeah, no worries. It says removed. I'm, I'm, I imagine you have like a flag or something that's there. You know how Facebook is. If I shared this link directly or had my team share it, would that work as well or no? Yeah, just try to not share the StreamYard link because people will technically be able to join this live call. You would have to share the link on YouTube. I put it in private chat um, on StreamYard that you should be able to see inside of there. Got it. All right, let me just let me try and drop that link real quick. Cool. Yeah, take your time. Um, I'm going to send it through email as well. And then we'll get started for 3 o'clock right on the dot. All right, just shared it. Do you have a message you put with it when you posted it? Because if so, I can copy that as well. Because I just kind of just put join us live. Sure. I mean, yeah, that works. I just put, hey guys, live with Josh Nelson now. Sweet. Uh, and then I linked it. So, um, all right, cool. Yeah, that's good to go. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess we can get started since we're already live. So, uh, Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here today. Um, I do want to give you the chance to go ahead and introduce yourself for people that don't know you. Sure. So, um, Josh Nelson, I run two businesses. I run Plumbing and HVAC SEO, which is our agency that works with plumbing and HVAC companies across the country with their internet marketing. Uh, we've grown that to about four and a half million dollars per year. 
Um, made the Inc. 5000 list fastest growing companies in the United States four years in a row. Um, got a great team of about 30 US based team members all day, every day work in that business. Um, and I also run Seven Figure Agency, which is my, my coaching and mentorship program where I coach digital marketing agencies how to grow and scale um, following the model that, that we've used. Got it. And so you mentioned before, so your total agency experience is about 15 years with your previous agency and now your plumbing and HVAC SEO. Um, what was your vision for your previous agency before finding out your niche model? So there's kind of a couple different iterations of it. There was Develicom, which was my first agency that I started kind of right out of right out of high school, in college age. Um, my vision was I want to I'm going to get into internet marketing. I'm going to help you know local businesses generate more sales or kind of get their websites dialed in, and uh, had the wrong model, like seriously the wrong model. I was trying to sell websites for between a thousand and two thousand dollars one time fee. I was charging fifty dollars a month uh, for hosting, and I was like, oh, eventually that's gonna that's gonna snowball. Um, and I really worked hard. Like I was I was cold calling. I was going to BNI meetings. I was going to the Chamber of Commerce. I was, you know, just cranking away and I, I would, I would sell like five or six websites any given month, which seems like, Hey, that's not so bad, right? For a college kid making six to 10 grand. Uh, but I also spent all of that money. Like I rented an office. I had a business partner. I did, you know, I was like buying leads and things like that for myself. Um, and so during that whole first business venture, um, I lost money. I, I never paid myself a, a salary or anything. I could have made a lot more money working at, at Burger King or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you, you talk about some really interesting points there, like buying an office right away. I think that most entrepreneurs, they get really excited when they're making money and they want to buy offices. I did want to touch on something really quick that you said was interesting, though. Your name was Develocon and we are Develomark. So where did you come up with that name and how did you, how did you use that? Develicom, I think it was like development commerce. Um, I had, a, I had a partner at the time, Joseph Licata, and it was, it was his idea. He thought it was really cool. And so that is funny. It's very close in, in, in the naming structure. It's incredible because we're develop mark is like what you said, it's develop your marketing. That's where I came up with the name. So it's interesting that people going into this field think very alike. Yeah. So, um, okay. And then tell me about like when you had that aha moment, when you were like, okay, I I'm trying this business model. I'm very young. I've made some failures. I made some mistakes. It's not clicking. When did you see this monthly retainer model and how did you transition to that with how you approached customers and what did you do with your existing customers? Like, that's what I'm super curious about. So that's probably like a couple steps. I'll try and make it real quick, but you know, that, that first business developcom, I had to shut it down. Like I, I finished college. Um, I was getting married to my wife, Yesenia, um, and I needed money. Like it was just time to get paid. And so I went out and got a regular job. I worked in corporate America for a couple of years. Um, and the whole time I was working, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I wanted to run my own business and kind of create wealth. All of the books tell you to do this, right? Um, and so, and so I, I just started seeking, like, what are the agencies out there that are actually successful, that are growing? Um, and that's when I came across Reach Local. And they, I think at the time they were doing $250 million per year. They were just about to go public. And I was like, hey, I just need to get a job there and kind of see what they're doing and learn what they're up to. And I sold at Reach Local as a IMC for a couple of, uh, a couple of years. And that's where I, I saw like, well, holy moly, like this model I'm doing was ridiculous. I'm trying to sell these websites and this hosting fee where really I should be selling internet marketing that's going to generate leads, sales, revenue growth. And I need a monthly retainer fee that's greater than $1,000 per month, right? And I think working there, I saw that model in action and I saw the rapid growth. But then I also saw thousands of salespeople across the country selling into the average Joe business, the average plumber, the average roofer, the average dental office, and getting between $1,000 and $5,000 per month. Um, I think that's really like when it started to click for me that this model would be much different and much better. So you actually tried the model, then you got a job at Reach Local, which is a very successful agency for several of its reasons. And then, then you internalized in your own brain how to do this even more finite with a vertical. Is that kind of your, your progression there? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. And the reason I joined is because I knew like 
I knew I wanted to be successful, but I, since I failed, I needed to find someone that had a model that was actually working. Um, and I was happy there. I just got a little bit frustrated with the results I was getting the clients. And so I was like, okay, now I've got this model. I've got this idea. I know if I did this on my own, I could get better, more consistent results for the clients. Um, and even when I started my own business, um, you know, my next agency, which I guess we're timestamping, it was like back in 2010, 2011, um, it was a generalist company, right? It was, it was Click Inc. We were going to work with all local businesses. Uh, we thought maybe restaurants might be the play. We thought maybe we could get into a couple of different verticals. Um, but after a couple of months running that business and kind of seeing the challenges of trying to figure it out for one vertical and then another and then another and then the questions that come up every day, which is like, show me who else you worked with. Can I talk with one of your other clients in this space? It just became clear it would be so much easier and I could grow so much faster if I focused on one vertical. And that's, you know, that's kind of how we landed on plumbing and have kind of built from there. Now, while you were at Reach Local, were you working with plumbers and you were like, wow, these these types of businesses are getting so much better results than your roofing? Like, how did you pick plumbing? You know, I wish I could say I was that smart about it. I, I worked with a couple of plumbers. I worked with a couple of bankruptcy attorneys. I worked with a couple of dentists or with a couple, you know, a couple different verticals. Um, and when we started Click Inc., the idea was restaurants. Well, like, oh, restaurants is a great play because they're social. You know, they, they need these different things we can do. Um, and we we went to town, you know, calling on restaurants and hustling to restaurants. We we never landed a restaurant, um, but I landed a plumbing company and I did see it reach local home services was just a really successful vertical right across all of the different you know markets. Home services did really well. Um, and so we we landed a plumber. I think he paid us fifteen hundred bucks, maybe two thousand dollars to set up his website and do some local SEO for him. And. Me, me and my business partner actually left that meeting like, hey, this is great. We got it. We got some revenue. Um, we're not going to go deep on plumbing, right? We're going to kind of test, test out these other verticals. Uh, but when we knocked out of the park for that client and then he referred us to somebody else and then we got somebody else, we started to realize, well, wait a minute. There's there's something here, right? There's something about the plumbing and HVAC industry. They've got the money to spend. They're at the time very used to spending money in the yellow pages uh, and so there was a clear market to say, hey, let's take the money out of the yellow pages. Let's shift it to online. Um, and the, the budget was already earmarked, unlike we had seen in some of the other verticals where we would have to convince them to spend two grand a month in this industry for whatever reason. They just they were already spending that and more. And so it was just the reallocation of funds. Mm. And, and let's uh, dial it back just a little bit there. Um, cause you said some really interesting topics. First thing I want to know is like, how old were you? Like, so you, you mentioned in, you had high school website, you were doing high school, website designs in high school. And then you went to work for reach local. Like what age were you then? Man, I, I was, I should do the bath on this. I think I must've been 26 or 27 ish. When you were at reach local. Yeah. So like, so either, like, I don't know the exact age, but sequentially it was i was like in the 25 27 range at that point okay and then extremely ironic that i did the same thing i went after restaurants um we had a lot of success with them the issue was the owners were never available for a phone call or, or they just didn't pay attention and it's like easy for them to say hey we don't want to use you anymore um tell me about what you learned at reach local that got them to 250 million dollars when most agencies can't even crack seven figures yeah um I, you know, they were, there's a, they're a sales driven organization. Um, they have one basic thing at the time that they sold, which was monthly recurring. You couldn't go out and sell a website standalone. You couldn't go out and sell a project. It was like everything you sold was going to have a recurring fee to it. Um, their, their unique mechanism at the time was they're going to run paid search. They're going to make the phone ring. They're going to track all those phone calls and be able to show you the return on investment. You know, that was something at the time that was new and innovative in the industry. Um, and so these, these local businesses were like, hey, well, if you can show me the actual recordings and show me that I'm getting ROI, I'll, I'll make that investment and I'll stick with it. Um, so they did that really well. And then they put salespeople in basically every city across America, making cold calls, sitting in B&I meetings, scheduling appointments, closing deals and managing, um, managing clients. So I think that was the key, like the key thing that really propelled reach locals growth. 
And would you say that that model has changed at all? Or is that kind of still a primary selling model for agencies? Like, hey, we're going to set up a website for you. We're going to do paid search and it's going to make the phone ring and we're going to show you the phone. Or are you seeing the market shift to it becoming more complex? Like, hey, we need a CRM. We need text automations. Like, what are you seeing? Because I know you're a big go high level person and we're going to dive really deep into that. But I definitely want to know, like when you were at Reach Local, it's kind of like a model that we promote to customers. It, have you seen that change much? And what's innovative now? I think it, I mean, I think the ball is constantly moving. I think for a while, it, just choosing a niche was something that was like new and innovative. Right. But now everybody's kind of going down that niche path. Um, and so as the market matures, you have to constantly be thinking about what's your right to win. Right. And what's your unique mechanism that you're bringing to the table. Um, and so while call tracking and ROI tracking is important. Um, I think if you can help them get more focused on not just generating leads, but actually generating booked calls, generating revenue growth, putting automations in place and kind of looking at the entire online marketing equation as a whole, uh, that can differentiate you from, from the competition. Because uh, it is interesting how it's evolved, right? At, at first, it was just, as an agency, we're going to drive traffic for you, right? And that was okay. But then they were like, well, that's not really that exciting. All right, well, then you know, we're going to drive rankings for you and traffic, right? And you could get away with showing a ranking report. Look at all the keywords you rank for. Um, and then it was like, okay, that's not, you know, that's helpful, but really we want calls, right? It was all about, we're going to generate phone calls and leads for you. The, the next iteration is we're going to generate sales, right? We're actually going to make the cash register ring. Um, and the agencies that can be further on the side of that spectrum um, are going to be most successful. Yeah. And that, that's, that's very interesting that you say that. And we'll, we're going to touch on a few things that you mentioned there, but um, most agencies, some of the larger ones like thrive, um, which is a, I'm sure a competitor to reach local, they've actually gotten it down to the payment processing now. So like customers just know the ROI of their website, but I did want to touch on something before we kind of move too fast and go into some of the more technical things. Um, tell me about what it's like being in a business partnership and what you would recommend and what you wouldn't recommend with that. Because I think you're, you're still in a business partnership, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. How has your experience been with that? Um, I, have, I have a great business partner, Dean IDC. We've been working together since, since 2010 when we started Click Incorporated. Um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons, right? There's, there's always pros and cons. You know, should you do it on your own? Should you do it with a partner? Um, for me, I think as long as you can find a partner that's got complementing skills, um, that's, that's always going to be beneficial. So if you're, you're a great salesperson and you're great at kind of being on video and being the face of the company, usually that's going to be something that's st strong and there's usually some type of deficiency. And in most cases, it's on the operations side, like actually knowing how to do the SEO and do the pay-per-click or having the patience and the desire to stick with doing that type of work over time. Um, and so if you can find someone that their passion is doing the operations and running the ship and kind of the behind the scenes work, that's a, that's a great synergistic business partner that, that might make sense. And so that's, that's what, what happened with me. And uh, it's obviously worked out really well. And so what would be like the biggest piece of advice that you would give somebody that's in a business partnership right now and they're not satisfied? And biggest piece of advice, you know, just get really clear on like what your strengths are, what their strengths are and expectations because uh, sometimes you wind up disenchanted, right? You thought this person was one thing and they turn out to be completely different. Uh, I think you should just get really clear on what it is that you're dissatisfied about. Get it down on paper, meet with that counterpart, that business partner and have a tough conversation. Um, I, I, was, I was in a meeting with, with somebody a couple of days ago and th this came up. Um, and I, I think kind of the, the, key, the key nugget was that resentment doesn't go away. Right. Resentment is only going to escalate. So you need to either nip it in the bud right away and say, hey, look, this is the reality that we weren't expecting. Here's what we need you to change um, or, or like shift, shift course really quickly. Understood. And so how do you avoid resentment? I, like I just said, right, write down, like, here's what I was expecting you to do. Here's what's not happening and sh shift the course. Right. Hey, look, you know, I thought you were going to be able to handle the operations. Clearly, you're not capable of that. Should we, should we renegotiate our deal? Obviously, we're going to have to hire an operations person now. Um, how, how do you feel about that? Am I misunderstanding this on my end? Um, and just kind of work through it and, and 
don't avoid those uncomfortable conversations. No, that totally makes sense. And I think most people build resentment when they don't want to have the tough conversation. So it kind of just stays there. And yeah. you're absolutely right about that. Um, in terms of plumbing SEO, um, which is obviously, I mean, the name is pretty straightforward. Was there a strategy behind how you named your agency or did you kind of just like want to rank for keywords? At the beginning, it was, we just, we wanted to rank. We wanted to come up with someone who was looking for SEO, for plumbing, for dentists, for roofers. And so we bought a bunch of those domains. Um, and, and working at Reach Local, my only play was pay-per-click. And I saw almost everybody at the time was like, I tried the pay-per-click thing. I want to do SEO. I want to come up organically. Um, and so, you know, being able to lead with, hey, look, we specialize in getting you ranked. Forget the paid stuff. Let's, let's get you ranked and get you the free clicks and the free traffic. Obviously, that's evolved over time, but that was the initial thought process. Understood. And so what does your offering like today look like? If I'm a plumbing business and I'm doing $5 million a year, I have maybe 100 employees, great text, great reputation. That's your ideal client, I imagine. Um, yep. what, does that, what does that sales process look like? And what are you actually offering that customer that's kind of non-negotiable, but then what are like the a la carte things that you add as well? Great question. So, yeah, I mean, like you said, like our ideal client is kind of between a million and five million to $10 million per year, kind of in that, in that sweet spot. Um, usually what we're doing is new website built to convert. You know, that's just core to what we do. Um, optimizing it to rank for the most important keywords on page, off page, Google maps, reputation management, um, putting a paid search strategy in place, which is typically focused on Google ads and local service ads and kind of tapping into that equation and then putting all the tracking in place so we can see where we rank. We can see how many calls we're getting. We can project the ROI if they've got service tight or one of these other platforms piping that in so we can really help them get granular with the results um, and then leveraging marketing automation, right? Which is, we call it conversion amp. That's our white label version of high level, taking those leads, putting them to a nurture sequence, doing database reactivation, um, we, we come with that kind of comprehensive approach. Uh, we found that, you know, just trying to a la carte, we're just going to do a website or we're just going to do pay-per-click or we're just going to do SEO. Um, our results are very hit or miss. But when we come in and say, hey, Mr. Plumbing or HVAC business owner, here's where you're at. Here's what you're telling me your goals are. I've looked at what you're doing online. These are the deficiencies. If you agree that those are the deficiencies, this is what we should do in order to, to really help you hit those targets. Here's what it is. And then we charge... Um, $2,500 per month for that bundle of, of services. Okay. Plus and that's, that spend is separate to that. That's very reasonable. Um, oh, and yeah. I have a thousand questions already. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thousand questions. Um, first question, uh, do, do it's a client comes to you and they just got their website built and they got it built six months ago. How do you handle that situation? I mean, and there was a time we were like, hey, look, let's just try and work with the existing site. You know, like they, let's say they just got a beautiful site done by one of the high end organizations. It still creates friction for us because, you know, when you've got it in your own WordPress setup and you've got it in your own theme and you've got your own plugins and it's in your hosting platform, you can control almost everything. When you're taking an existing site um, and it's got its own random theme and its own random stuff going in the background, so many things can go wrong. Um, and so, I mean, believe it or not, this doesn't happen very often. Like I would say this happens one in 10 situations where they're saying, hey, we just got this done. We love this site. Um, in those situations, we would say, hey, you're right. It's a good site. Let us rebuild it for you with all the same pages, with all the same layout, with all the same content um, and put it onto our platform. Um, mm -hmm. That way we can control it. We can control the site speed and we can make sure that you get the outcomes that you're after. But yeah, we're always rolling out a, a new version of the site. Understood. So you actually, and that's, that's incredible. I'm already learning so much from this conversation. So you actually have new versions of the website that you kind of work on every year and introduce them to new clients per se. Um, I, I don't say that question again. So you have like a standard site setup for an average plumbing company that you use ongoing to better for your efficiencies. Um, so do you work on that same type of site every year and introduce like kind of like the iPhone, right? Like you have a previous iPhone, then you have the new right. iPhone. That is, is that kind of like what you guys so do? So it's built on a, it's built on a framework, right? We've got our own custom theme. We've got our, like, we know that these are the elements that we're going to put in place. 
Um, it's unique to every client though. So we create a new comp design for the homepage, the internal page. Um, so it, it looks completely unique client facing and it's unique to their company. Um, but it is, it is a kind of a cloned behind the, you know, behind the scene version. And yeah, we probably updated at least every nine months with a new iteration, the newest version, the newest things running in the background. And are you, so your $2,500 monthly fee, are you charging like a one-time fee up front for that site? Or are you just kind of going right into the retainer and kind of letting the client know that's included in the price? We, we go straight into the monthly fee. Um, it, I've just found like when we charge a, a website design fee, the conversation shifts from you're doing internet marketing and you've got this complete package instead of you're doing this stuff for me to generate lead sales and growth within my business. Um, and, and sometimes we would get the first payment and we wouldn't start to get that consistent monthly recurring revenue. Um, mm -hmm. So we say, hey, it's a $5,000 setup fee. If you can get started now, we'll waive the setup fee. Just go straight to $2,500 per month. It's going to include the website, all of the content, all of the unique pages we're going to build out for you. Um, and it just creates a little bit of an urgency to move forward quickly. That's uh, very interesting. Interesting. Because I've heard that debated very, very often. Because you're right. You're not really selling. Like, plumbers don't need this insane web flow design. You know what I mean? Like, they need something that's going to convert into the sales. Yeah. Um, okay, awesome. And then, like, when uh, when you are using High Level, that's integrating with your existing site design. And tell me about that setup and that automation, how you help customers with that. Yeah, so... You know, this is a, it's a work in progress, right? We've probably been using the high level stuff for going on two years now. Um, it's predominantly going to be the web form, right? If you think about the web form that's on your typical site for a long time, it was just a standard form that sent an email off to the customer. You know, hey, you got a lead, call them. Um, and as you looked at that, like basically nobody was calling that lead back. They weren't calling back quickly, that's for sure. And those leads were going to waste. So now we've got what we call smart forms, right? It's going to be your high level form. So when that gets submitted, automatic call, two-way call to the office, automatic text message to that customer, a couple of follow-ups that automatically happen, which is helping them convert more of those leads at a much higher level. Um, also putting the little chat widget, which we can bring in through high level to start those two-way text conversations. Um, those are the, the, like, the main places that it, it, it interacts with the site itself. We're still building the site on, on WordPress um, and the landing pages on WordPress, and it's just the web form and the and the chat predominantly. Our uh, go high level. Yes. Okay. And tell me more about your daily time management. So you own, you do two brands, right? You have Plumbing SEO, and then you have Seven Figure Agency. I was, we were talking previously before we actually went live of how impressed I am of you managing both at the great time. And you told me leadership, right? But I'm curious to know more about like what your day's like because um, managing a YouTube channel and doing an agency is incredibly difficult to do. Like if you look at Rustin Kratz at Scorpion, the guy does no social media, right? Like he just doesn't have to, he does, that's just not his focus. So I'm like really curious to know why you do what you do. <laughs> so I would say kind of a loaded question, a couple different things there. I'll try and address them in, in the order they make sense to me. Um, why I do what I do, I, I love helping digital marketing agencies. I have a, a like a hyper passion for this, um, helping agencies kind of get out of that struggle phase in their business to the point where they're making more money, they're having more freedom, they're having a bigger impact. Um, I was thinking about like what, before I started Seven Figure Agency, what 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 are the types of things I would love to do every day? And I could talk with somebody about landing clients and delivering results all day long. Um, and, in running eight, you know, seven figure agency was the answer, right? I, I just love this. I have a passion for it. Um, so that's, that's kind of why I do this as opposed to just focusing exclusively on the agency. Um, timeframe wise, as the company has grown, we strategically built it in a way where we weren't physically doing most of the work within the business. So if you go back and read like E-Myth Revisited, um, you know, that was the whole concept of e right? You don't want to just be the web designer and web guy. You want to actually build a business that can operate without you. Um, and so, you know, take that now to EOS, the entrepreneur operating system, which is kind of the underlying system in which we use to run our agency. Over the last five years, we figured out the things that we're really good at, me and my business partner, 
and the things that we're not good at and the things that we don't like to do. And anything that's not in our sweet spot, in our strength zone, we've consciously removed ourselves from. Um, and so we've got a leadership team, people that, you know, a leader that handles sales, a leader that handles the marketing side, a leader that handles client onboarding and fulfillment, a leader that handles all of the operations, the website, SEO, pay-per-click, um, and then the, like the billing and administrative side of the business. And so um, now we've got that going. My, my time in plumbing HVAC SEO is predominantly um, doing like the promotional webinars, which I'm still kind of the face of plumbing and HVAC SEO, uh, and then showing up for our level 10 meeting, which happens every Wednesday with that leadership team and making sure they've got the direction and they've got clarity on kind of where we're at, what we're looking to do and solving all of the, the problems in between. Understood. So your, your seven figure agency is like pure passion. And then your plumbing SEO is leadership, which you obviously like doing as well. Um, so tell me a little bit about like your book, because your book was wildly successful for agencies. I think most people that are starting agencies and have visited Facebook have probably seen your book. Um, seven figure agency roadmap. There you go. New cover art looks great. Thanks, man. Tell me what. Tell me like why you chose to write a book and what that's done for your business. So, um, I, I published a book for plumbing and HVAC SEO as well. I'm a big fan of being the published author. I think just having a book positions you differently than most people in the space. Um, and so, I took that same concept and applied it to the agency coaching business. Um, I think there's lots of free lead magnets and webinars that are out there. Um, but a good book that goes deep into like how we built our business, how we land clients, deliver results, retain and scale um, is different and, and unique. Um, and so, I mean, the book has been a big part of the growth of Seven Figure Agency, right? Because it's on Amazon. It's got 340 or so reviews at this point. Um, and then we're able to use a free plus shipping funnel, which, you know, you know thank you, uh, Russell Brunson, right, for unpacking that whole model for everybody right? You, you get the free book, but you pay for the shipping. Now I've got your credit card information. And then you get an offer for like a, a course where I unpack it on video for you. And you kind of spend a little bit more there. So it covers all the Facebook ads. Then I invite you to my two day event where you get even more value. And so it just gives me a chance to build a really strong relationship and bond with growing agency owners um, and kind of help them see the value I can bring to the table before they sign up for the coaching and mentorship part of what we do. Mm. And it's interesting because I spoke with um, uh, Impact, Branding and Design, um, Marcus Sheridan, who wrote They Ask You Answer. And oh, he, he it, it changed their entire business. So, and he basically said, it's the number one advice I can give anybody looking to get more awareness is write a book. So um, now we're you know, shifting into some of that client related stuff. Uh, what's the recipe for a really bad and like upset customer? The recipe for a really bad upset customer um, is probably twofold. Um, first, sell the relationship, oversell it, um, and fail to communicate. Right, that's the first piece. Like you don't you don't communicate, you're gonna you're gonna lose the client. The second is is don't deliver. Right, don't don't do the work correctly they don't get results. You, you know, either of those cases, you're going to have a really upset customer and, and a high churn rate. So if you can't deliver for a client, would your agency, let's, let's say previously, because I know you've changed a lot now and you have the luxury of getting some of these bigger businesses to say, I've heard good things about you. I want to work with you. And they don't really care about the price, but like, were you turning away clients when you started? And like, would you turn away clients now, depending on like some type of, um, things that you look at? Yeah, for, for sure. Great, great question. I think you always want to be a little bit selective. Like, I mean, you want to make sure that there's a clear path. Like here's the company I'm thinking about working with. Here's their issues. And here's how I think we can help. If there's not a clear path, you should probably pass on, on that. Um, I'll say right now in our business, we're very clear that we're working with at least a half a million dollar plumbing or HVAC business. Um, and that's our fit, right? If they're not going to be at least that size, we say, hey, look, it's not going to be a good fit. Go, you know, go talk to somebody else. When we started working with plumbing and HVAC companies, we didn't have that awareness and, and we didn't have a lot of case studies either. So it was like anybody that ran a plumbing company, whether they were one man operation or a huge corporation, uh, we would take that business. And you're going to find you can great, build great relationships with those smaller individuals, those one, two man operators. Um, 
you can probably create great success stories in a lot of cases where it's like they went from you know 250k to 700k and it's like a huge impact on their life um but your our success rate with those smaller operators has been the lowest right and that's where you wind up spending a lot of time and energy with uh clients that that don't appreciate you sometimes at the level that you should they should and they don't stick around long term mm -hmm. and when you when you're starting out you kind of almost have to just kind of deal with it because you don't have like people knocking at your door wanting to work with you. Yeah. What was like, how did your client base, like when you dialed it in, you were like, I'm going to do plumbing companies. How long did it take for you to grow your client base? And like, what was your driving mechanism for the growth of that client base? Yeah, great. So since we're kind of reversing back almost uh, 11 years at this point. Um, initially we had, we had clients in, in a bunch of different verticals, right? And it was, we had plumbing, we had roofing, we had dentistry, we had a couple of attorneys, we had a couple of chiropractors. Um, and once we started to get some momentum within, within plumbing, you know, we were able to say, hey, look, let's just focus on this. And I know you want to have that conversation about how you start turning that other business away. But you know, if, you, if you looked at how we got those initial clients, it was, it was brute force, right? It literally, the initial like, handful of clients, it was cold calling, sitting in B&I meetings, going to the chamber of commerce, doing drop in, literally physically dropping it at offices. Hey, I got this thing for you. Um, and, and doing cold email. Like we, we were grabbing email lists and sending messages and getting responses and jumping on calls. Um, and so I think at the beginning, your agency, you have to do that brute force and there's things you can do to make that easier. But until you've got some success under your belt, until you've got some client results, you know, you're going to have to brute force, you know, your way through. Understood. And I think that that's people expect that almost like my route was very different. My route was I'm going to go on YouTube and just like work on my clients on my channel. And that worked well because I attracted a lot of people that were trying to do it themselves, but then like wanted to hand it off. But that creates its own challenge. Right. Because uh, then they're, they're kind of like DIY, but they're also done with you. Mm -hmm. I have a question that just came up in my mind as you were, were talking about growing your client base, your offer, your twenty five hundred dollar offer. Has that changed much since you've started Plumbing SEO? And do you have clients that are bigger? And if so, why? Yeah, so it, it has changed significantly. So when we started, it was a thousand bucks a month for website and SEO, right? That's that's where we started. Um, you know, now it's twenty five hundred dollars per month, and there's there's add ons that get it up to five thousand dollars per month plus you know a percentage of their ad spend. Um, and the, the type of sized client has, has definitely, definitely changed because as we've, as we've gotten more proven results and we've kind of gotten smarter with how we're marketing and what pockets of the industry we work in, um, you know, we went from getting a lot of small man operators to more, you know, one to $10 million per year plumbing HVAC home service companies. Got it. And the retainer, doesn't change or are there clients where you're just like much more involved and you charge more or is it just like one program? It's, I mean, there, there are add-ons, but it's not like it, it exponentially grows, right? It's like $2,500 per month on average. You know, there's a couple clients paying up to five or $6,000 per month, but it's, it's kind of in that, in that sweet spot. Understood. And I, I think that that's creates a lot of clarity for your growth. Um, specifically because I've had, I've talked to agencies where they have clients that are 30,000 a month, but if they lose that client, it's a big stress point for them. So naturally my yeah. next question is why 2,500 bucks a month? Like, why is it that number? Is it, I'm sure there's a financial reason and, and like, a, uh, you've done research and stuff, but curious to know where in Josh Nelson's head and your partner's head said the program's 2,500 bucks. Yeah. Um, I think because we started at a thousand, we kind of, even at that price when we were starting felt like a big ask it was like man a thousand bucks a month's a lot it's a lot of money right we get 10 clients we're going to be making six figures a year like life is grand um <laughs> and you know we had good coaching and you know people were saying look you need to you need to charge a little bit more right and we're like oh, we can't charge more no one would ever pay more and then we reach you know we go to fifteen hundred dollars a month and we say well, let's see what's going to happen and then like the next five clients buy at fifteen hundred and you're like well holy moly this is this is great um I, I know that, you know, there are home service companies spending up to $10,000 a month and more for their internet marketing, like in the right, in the right sizes. Uh, we just found like there's really a sweet spot 
in, in almost every vertical across the United States where companies can comfortably spend between $1,000 and $3,000 per month. And they could spend a lot more, but you know they're comfortable spending between $1,000 and $3,000. And it's a small enough number that as long as you're generating leads, you're generating sales, a tangible return on investment, it would like make no sense at all for them to cancel your services. Um, and so I think that's why we kind of fly in that you know, perceivably maybe lower side of the equation uh, because the clients stick, right? And they, and they, they love what we do. And we feel really good about the, the, the results that we're delivering for the, for the investment that's being made. Love that answer. Yeah. And I think you're, you're absolutely right about that um, in, in the line item section of it. Cause a, a business that's doing a million dollars a year, 83,000 hours a month is what it breaks down to. So, you know, plumbing SEO takes out 2,500 bucks. They still have 80 something thousand dollars and that's their entire marketing all most of the time. Right. And then you have like your ad spend, which I'm going to ask a lot of questions about ads. One question for you though, as you talked about increasing your prices subtly over time with new clients, how did you handle your legacy clients at the previous rate that they were at? Yeah. I mean, this it's just, it's the way we chose to operate was people bought at whatever price they bought and they got grandfathered in, right? We weren't going to go back to, you know, the client's been with us for you know a year that loves us and say, Hey, thanks so much. Now we want to take you to 1500 bucks a month. We probably could have, um, we might have lost a few. It probably would have been more profitable, but we just chose to new clients come in at a little bit higher price and the existing ones got grandfathered in. And that's just how we've graduated the, the business. I think that's the approach that most people do because um, it almost is a grandfathering in almost. It's, you know, it's like you buy a software at a certain price uh, in places like AppSumo, right? They give you that grandfathered price for the time period. So I definitely, I definitely like the answer on that because it's a very awkward conversation. Like, hey, I'm randomly going to push you up to 2,500 bucks a month. You might get a yes, but the client's going to feel uncomfortable about it. So um, does that create operational friction in plumbing SEO that you're dealing with so many clients at once? Like how many clients do you have? And does that create, how do you avoid operational friction of working with so many accounts at once? We've got about a hundred and 180 or so clients at this point. Um, I, I think as long as you've got your systems and procedures pretty well dialed in, right? There's a, there's a launch process. Here's the things we're going to do to launch this client. Well, setting up the website, writing the content, claiming the directories, putting the reputation system in place and everything that goes into that. Uh, here's the ongoing process, right? Here's what we're going to do month in and month out. Here's the deliverable. How, here's how we're going to communicate that back to the client. Um, and then, you know, put it into a system like ClickUp where we can, we can know here's who's responsible for these tasks. Here's when this stuff needs to be done um, and have an operations manager that's looking over all of that and keeping everything on task. Um, it really doesn't create too much operational friction for us. Like we've got that pretty well dialed in. Love it. And I would imagine that's just hours and hours and hours of just refining your process. Um, quick question for you, 180 clients, um, which is stellar. Uh, tell me about a flawless onboarding process. What does that look like at Plumbing SEO? Yeah, so I think it's it's a combination of, you know, doing the operation side well, but really thinking about the client experience. The one thing we learned over the years was results alone don't retain clients. Like you can get them ranked and get their phone ringing and that will take you so far. But if you're not communicating, if you're not showing the love, if you're not creating a great experience, it's very easy, even if they're, they're getting great results for them to go somewhere else. Um, so we're really conscious of making the onboarding process easy, getting the right usernames, passwords, contact, USP images, um, having a really well-structured onboard sequence of emails and text messages that they get, um, orchestrating that initial conversation with the account manager uh, so that they're being resold on the value, they're being resold on the company, um, and then dropping strategic gifts. We send a, a welcome basket. We send a thank you box. Um, you know, and just kind of thinking about all of those touch points, I think, create a great onboarding experience, which ultimately sets the pace for that relationship. What happens in the first week with a client really will dictate whether they're with you a year down the road or not, right? If you come out impressive and they're like, man, I made the right choice. These guys are on top of the ball. They're super professional. Like that's going to carry you a long ways. And when the situation doesn't go as planned, because it happens, right? I'm yeah. sure that's happening. I'm sure you've gotten your heart broken plumbing SEO, right? And it was yeah, out of yeah. your control, right? But it's always your control because it's your company. Yeah. Um, how do you restore that relationship? I mean, I think the best thing to do, you know, despite all the great technology that exists, 
is to get them on the phone, have a conversation, own up to it, own up to it in advance. Um, and then usually if there's a dropped ball, you have to increase the frequency of communication. Like if your standard plan is we're going to do a launch call and then we're going to meet once a month to review the reports. When there's a screw up, you're going to compress that probably to weekly. Hey, we're going to let's get together next week again. Let's here's exactly what we're going to do. We'll circle back next week and we'll keep meeting every week until you feel confident, uh, Mr. Customer. And if you do that, not every time, but in a lot more cases than not, you can turn the relationship back around and kind of get back into clients' good graces. Understood. So dropping the ball, owning up to it, increasing frequency of communication. That's that wasn't technically planned, um, which is which is interesting. Now, after the onboarding part, tell me about flawless ongoing services. What does that look like at Plumbing SEO? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it comes down to account management, right, which is having that dedicated person assigned to the account that's responsible for meeting with them on a monthly basis or at least sending a recap every month. Communicating not all of the technical aspects, but communicating the, the key things they want to know. We call it strategic reporting, which is how much did you spend? How many leads did you generate? What's your projected return on investment? Right? I think in any marketing service, if the client can confidently feel like those metrics are under control and being well communicated, they care, they care a lot less about all of the little technical minutia. Like um, they're so ranking doing that, stuff like that. I'm sorry? No, I was saying they they don't care about the technical stuff, like their rankings or stuff like that. Right, exactly. Um, I think you know the number one reason a client's going to leave, and most people don't realize this, is perceived indifference. Right, they feel like you as an agency aren't really paying attention to them anymore. They feel like you don't care anymore, um, and so making sure that there's an intentionality on your account management team to check in with that client. Hey, let's, let's schedule our monthly review call. The report's out. Want to go through kind of what happened last month, what the plan for the next month is, um, and recognizing that not all clients take that meeting. We, we find that only about 60% of our clients have any interest in doing that meeting, but being intentional about reaching out for it, sending the email, and then shooting a quick video after the fact. Hey, I know you're busy this month. Sorry, we couldn't get together. Here's what I was going to cover. Here's what we're working on. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, you can really cover a lot of bases by just following that type of simple communication flow. Understood. And really quick question now we're talking about account managers. Does the on the person that onboards the cu customer at Plumbing SEO, are they the same person that manages the account ongoing or do you have two separate roles for that? It's two separate roles now. For a long time, I think as you're growing, until you've got enough clients that you would have multiple account managers, you, you need to train your account manager to do the onboarding and the management. And there's pluses to that, right? Because there's continuity of that individual relationship. Um, as we grew, it just became more, um, it became more efficient to have an, a launch coordinator. And that launch coordinator is responsible for, hey, welcome aboard, getting the usernames and password, kicking things off. And then handing off once the site's live, once the pay-per-click campaign is running to a account manager that manages the account on a month over month basis. Yeah, no, I can see that. And so like if you if you were to um, start your business over again, what would be the first five roles you would hire knowing oh, what you know now? Love it. Great, great a lot question. Of people, a lot of people are like, you know, they, they I, I imagine the people that watch my channel are anywhere from five to 10 staff members, if that, or maybe even yeah. less. So they always want to know, like, should I hire an account manager first? Should I do the SEO still? Like, what is what was that like for you? Yeah, I'll walk you, I'll walk you through it because I, I spent a lot of time engineering this for our seven-figure agency members. Um, depending upon your strengths, I find most people that start an agency that run an agency are more sales and, and kind of business development centric. Um, so the first thing we got, we took ourselves out of was operations, right? We wanted to know we sold the client, somebody else was going to do the work, set up the website, order the content, do all the stuff that has to be done. Because uh, if you're doing the work, there's no way you can focus on positioning, selling, and growing the business. So I think yeah. that's the first thing, whether it's a project manager or just somebody that's actually doing the, the, the work themselves, get yourself out of operations first. Um, second to that, depending upon how bottlenecked you are with your marketing, um, I think you might want a marketing assistant VA, right? Somebody that can help pull lists, send emails, tee up webinars, follow up with you know, warm leads for you and get scheduled in. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's optional, but 
you don't want to find yourself too busy doing the minutia within your marketing strategy to, to be able to focus on sales and actually doing the content. Um, third position though, or could be second, would be account management. I find once you get to about 17 clients, 15 to 17 clients, you're going to be pretty busy just talking to the client, going through the monthly reports, being there when they send a question, um, kind of being that go-between. You have to choose at that point, are you going to do account management and kind of pause out the growth from here and kind of grow very slowly? Or do you put an account manager in place at that point so that you can focus on continuing to grow and scale? I think the account manager kind of at that 15 to 17 client threshold is super, super important. Um, from there, you know, you're going to start hiring out your technical specialists, right? Your, maybe your web design team, your SEO team, your pay-per-click team, those types of roles. Um, usually, you're going to need one account manager per 25 or so clients. You know, and, and this is assuming your account manager doesn't actually do the work, but they're just responsible for managing that relationship and kind of being the liaison between operations. Um, and you know, one of my favorite positions to remove myself from, even though I'm great at sales, was sales. Because eventually you get to a place where, you know, let's say it's a million dollars, right? Eighty three thousand dollars per month, maybe a little bit prior to that. You're consistently working and you're growing and there's things going on. But you're, you're in sales calls 50% of your time, right? Meeting with clients, taking them through the sales process, asking for the business. Um, and one of my happiest days in my, in my business was the day I put a salesperson and they took that sales call for me and they closed the business. That's really where you've gone full circle in your agency, right? Where clients can be sold, they can be onboarded, they can be served, and they can be retained without you having to physically do any of that. Um, I think that's, that's where everybody wants to go uh, to have a true business as their agency. Yeah, in companies like Reach Local, um, Scorpion, uh, those companies, like they've just annihilated that. Like marketing is done, sales is done, they're verticalized. So yeah, I, I can agree with that. I think a lot of our challenges at Developmark is we're not verticalized. And so sometimes like I just have to get involved um, cause they want some of that thought leadership, but if it was the same vertical, I think it would just be like very much like we have the thought leadership. We've already done the research. Here's what works. Boom. And you kind of just move forward with it. And that, and that's the beauty of being in the niche, right? I think a lot of people think just about the niche because it's easier to sell. And that was my thought process. But what I realized is the ability to scale in a niche is equally as, as valuable, right? Because for every client that you get, you've already done the work. Right? You've already thought about what the keywords are. You've already thought about the content. You've already thought about the directories. You can build a project map. You can actually systematize it. And so when you sell it, you're not reinventing anything. It's just managing that same process. The other part is you can get extremely good at delivering the results. Right? You can mm -hmm. get really good because you're spending more time. Your team's spending more energy. You've got more data than someone that's hopping from one vertical to the next. Understood. At your level now, um, how how deep are you into like the creative and like the strategy for all of your clients? Um, not that much. Right? At this point, I've got a leadership team. I've got a director of operations uh, that, you know, I still get involved, but I'm not going in day after day looking at a lot of data and making a lot of shifts and changes to the overall strategy. The team does that. Understood. And that I think is one of the huge separation points at your agency is having strategy because you can hire an account manager. I'm sure you've seen this. You can hire an account manager, just take orders, but the true really good accounts manager is delivering strategy and like executing on it for your clients. Um, what do you do in a situation where random things are brought up from your clients of things that you don't necessarily do, um, but you know, you can do like, how do you tell clients no and create that healthy boundary? I think you just you have to choose your battles, right? You got to figure out here's what we're gonna do. Here's the, what we know is gonna generate the result. Um, and every now and then, if they're asking for something that's really super relevant that would be useful for everybody on your client base, you might say yes. Like an example of that for us was at some point one of our clients said, "Hey, you guys are doing a great job, and you're helping us get these reviews, but we want someone to respond to the reviews for us." Right? It was like. We, we don't have the time on our team to do that. It, was, it wasn't something we had built. And we thought, hey, you know what? If, if this client wants it, maybe would some of our other clients want it? And so we sent out a survey. Hey, you know, here's what we're thinking. Would you be interested in this service? And a bunch of them wrote back yes. And so we created 
reputation response at that point. And it was an incremental increase in their monthly fee. And now our team's looking and responding to the reviews on their behalf. Um, but I would say nine out of 10 times, they ask for something outside the box that isn't relevant. And we're just like, hey, that's not our strength. You know, find somebody else. We'll try and find somebody for you that you can use for that part. Because you can easily get sidetracked and side railed with random things outside your core service offering. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Um, Cause you're right. A lot of the times it's like, Hey, can you design this flyer or kind of something that's really irrelevant to what you're doing? And just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean you should. Um, so this is a really interesting question. And I, I actually got a couple of people to send in some questions that they requested for you. Um, how do you sell against companies like Scorpion? Um, I think we like we're very very conscious not to talk badly about anybody right and there's lots of competitors that that will sell into into home services um, usually we take a consultative sales approach so it's not saying bad about anybody but we're looking at your website we're looking at your rankings we're looking at your load speed we're looking at um kind of like the structure of your paid search campaign um and if it's good and they're cr crushing it with the rankings and they're crushing it with everything we'll, we'll tell them hey you're in great great hands it looks like scorpion's doing a good job for you uh, if there's problems and there's issues where we see, look, you know, this is why you're not performing in this area. Um, would you be interested in seeing how we can help you solve that? And they say, yes, you know, that's really how we're selling against the competition. It's not, oh, they're bad because of this. It's, it's just, let's look at the data. And if there's room for improvement, let's look at how we can, we can solve it. Mm, that's an interesting uh, way. So it's very methodical. Um, I had a, a gentleman, Jonathan Stark on this on uh, live the other day and, his answer to something like that was, well, there's a reason you're talking to me. So like uncovering why mm -hmm. it usually further than like, cause usually plumbing companies that are with like plumbing SEO or Scorpion or they're getting results. Like you said, that's not really why they're leaving. It's, it might be a relationship thing or et cetera. So that's interesting how you still go down the methodical approach of understanding the results behind it. Um, so Jonathan Henderson, actually one of your students who does uh, power washing marketing pros um, he wanted to ask, what's the number one thing that keeps agencies from scaling? I think the number one thing that stops agencies from scaling is, is the, the desire to control it themselves, right? So they like, they know how to do the website or they know how to do the pay-per-click. Um, and because they know how to do it, they keep, a, they keep, a, they keep doing it, right? Um, and when they do try and hire somebody to do it, they don't give them the space to learn the skill and to be able to take it off their hands. Um, I'd say that's probably the number one reason. Um, I think uh, Dan Martell is famously quoted as saying, um, typically an entrepreneur's Achilles heel is their superpower. Like the thing they're really good at is the thing they never want to let go of. And that's what keeps them from, from going to the next level. Mm -hmm. And so how did you come to um, fact with that situation when you had to create that separation? Yeah, I mean – just just recognizing I'm, I'm not here to do this work. I don't want to do this work, whatever this work is, right? At the beginning, it was I was building the websites at some level and writing the content. I didn't want to do that part. I know that I need to get myself out of that to have a truly growing agency um, and doing that at every stage of the game. Um, you know, one of the, one of the members I, I work with closely at Seven Figure Agency is Chris Rodriguez from Grow Pro Marketing. He's got a great agency working with um, uh, dojos, like uh, martial arts schools. And she's, she's got a great business. It's grown extremely quickly, but she loves sales. She loves the industry that she serves. And that's something like she was like, I, I'm going to continue to sell. Like there'd be no reason for me to take myself out of sales. And I was able to have the conversation like, look, you're not here to do this job of sales. You're here to build an agency to create more freedom, to create more impact and to make more money. Um, and so she was like, okay, let me hire a salesperson, right? Um, and by doing that, she really freed herself up and accelerated her growth. Um, I think that's, that's what you want to consciously do. Don't, don't get attached to any function within the business. And so if you're not attached to those functions now, like today at Plumbing SEO, like what are you working on there? Um, the main thing is leadership, right? Making sure we have the right people in the right seats, making sure that the direction is clear. Like, okay, here's where we're going as a company. Um, keeping an eye on the trends, things that are changing in the internet marketing, SEO, home services space, um, and making sure that the team is looking in the right direction uh, going forward. Um, and then still being the person that creates the content, the webinars and things, and kind of being the, the face of the organization. And are you guys like completely remote right now, or are you still going into the office? 
we're completely remote. Uh, we had we had an office in Doral up until October of last year. Um, really nice office. It was a great place. It was about 30 people coming in from Miami. Um, after COVID, we had to work from home. I was adamantly against virtual. Like I like was never going to go virtual in this business, uh, but it forced us to do it. Right, and we started working virtually for you know the better part of a year because we had a good leadership team and we kind of had our our pulsing communication in place. Um, we didn't miss a beat, right? Clients got great results. The service was still strong. Business was still growing. And we didn't need the office anymore. And I didn't need to drive an hour, you know, both ways anymore. Um, and so as of October, we shut the office. And now we've got a completely virtual team. Um, and the other like side benefit to that is we're able to attract talent outside of Miami, right? There's lots of really smart people in other parts of the country that we didn't have access to when we were a completely uh, localized operation. Interesting. Have you ever toyed with the idea of a four hour work week or I'm sorry, a four day work week? And if you did, tell me why. If you didn't, tell me why. I have, I've, I've toyed with the idea. Um, never did it. Um, I, don't, I think at the time it was, we were when I was really thinking about it was when we we're still in the office and, you know, you want people to come in, you want to be productive, you want to make the most of the space that you have. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't have any strong opinions against it, but just not something we do in our business. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. I ask everybody that question. Um, cause you know, like the, with the great resignation going on, um, how are you specifically, uh, retaining, um, talent? Yeah. And there's a great resignation is also more than great resignation. There's like, there's big companies that have lots of money trying to hire web people, SEO people, account managers, salespeople for agencies, right? These are in-demand skills. And at the average agency like, like ours and yours and, and everybody listening is only able to pay an account manager, let's call it forty-five dollars to $50,000 per year. You know, some of these companies are coming in and saying, hey, you can work from home. We're going to pay you $75,000 a year or more, right? Um, and so it, it's a trend that's happening in the industry you know, what we're, we try and create a great culture where people are here, they like it, they've got friends, uh, you know, they're, they're excited about what they do. Um, and we have to be, be cognizant to raise their compensation to be at least close enough that that's just, it, there's a certain amount that it's like, I would have to be crazy to keep staying at this company, right? You have to raise the money to, to that level. Um, and then look for like, I think that's what you're talking about with a four day week. At least you could say, Hey, we're only going to make you work four days where they're going to make you work five, right? They're going to make you work 60 hours instead of 40. And so you want to be creatively thinking about ways to retain your talent um, and, uh, and, and deal with that trend. How many employees do you guys have now? Uh, we've got about 30 full-time employees and probably like 15 uh, virtual. Do you like find MBAs that, and things like that. Do you find that that number is changing the more accounts that you get? Like it's, is it increasing like the more accounts that you get? I know it's kind of redundant, but it might have increased at a, a higher rate when you started. Is it, are you trying to hire less now and focus on your tech, like your automations and stuff like that? Or what's yeah. that like? Absolutely. As you, as you grow the amount of people that you need to incrementally serve the client base declines. Um, so, you know, the things that are pretty static would be number of clients per account manager. So like every 25 or so accounts, a little bit less than that, we need to hire another account manager because we know that they got to be trained up and they've got to get acclimated to our processes. Uh, and then every, every certain amount of accounts, we need a new pay-per-click person. We need a new, a new SEO person. Um, but a lot of the roles can be diffused across the entire client base. Interesting. And was there ever a time where you were like, I don't think I can pay the bills right now? Fortunately, no. I, I, in my previous agency, yes. Um, in this business, we've just been really blessed because we've got um, recurring revenue. We never took out any debt to start the business. So it was like on the back of our first client, we took that money and we, we did the work and we used that to, to grow the business. Um, and when you've got recurring revenue and you've got like fixed expenses, it's pretty easy. It's not a hard business model to have control of your financials and not have to worry about the stress of paying the bills. Yeah. And I think your price point is a really big testament to that because like if you had 180 clients at a thousand a month, your revenue would be drastically different. Right. And so you would just need more people to do more work. Yeah. Um, 
So, so what challenges are you going through now at the size that you're at? I understand you're about 4 million a year. Yep. Around that number. So that's uh, 4.5 4. ish. Okay. So right around like four, 450 K MRR, which is amazing. I can't wait until we're there. Um, what are some of your uh, challenges that you're seeing now that are kind of like new challenges that you've never experienced before? Um, well, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the, the great resignation, right? I mean, it, you've got challenges are current challenges that are pretty, pretty prevalent. Um, turnover in the account management role specifically, that's just a, a very, very high churn position, no matter how well you train them, no matter how much you pay them. Um, you know, I think we've had 100% turnover in our account management staff like five times over the last couple of years. Uh, yeah. And so that that's a very real challenge. So being conscious of having a constant pool to train new account managers, get them onboarded, get them ramped up. Um, and with that challenge comes the client feeling like they're getting the hot potato switch, right? Where they had this guy and now they've got this girl and now they're going to somebody else. Um, you know, being creative about how do we spin that into a positive way? So that like, hey, Mr. Client, good news. You're being placed with a new account manager. This is Tim. He's got all of this experience. He's got this great background that he's going to be able to look at your account with a new fresh set of eyes, um, you know, drop something into the mail. That, that was a challenge we had to solve for because, you know, if they feel like they're constantly getting switched, that creates uh, issues. Mm. The other one is, you know, company grows, expenses grow, um, compensation for everybody that's been with the company longer and longer needs to grow because I've been with you for this amount of time and I want to make more money and people need incremental improvements. So just really figuring out how to manage the financials in a way to still have a healthy profit uh, while still paying more and more to the, the team that you've got to get the work done. Yeah. And I, I could see that problem even at a million. I right. mean, I think it, once you're doing big numbers, those are always the challenges. Yeah. Um, so like, in terms of that like churn that you were talking about, two questions on that. One, do you think remote has anything to do with that churn? And two, would you ever consider outsourcing your account management? So I would say, I'll, I'll go backwards. I wouldn't outsource account management, right? I think there's, there's certain key things within your business that you have to control. I think never outsource your core competency the people managing the relationship with your clients, having those conversations, um, are that is the business, right? And so you you don't want to you don't want to outsource that role. Um, I think the first question. Can you repeat it one more time? It was: Do you think that the churn of accounts management, or just churn in general, has to do with the complete remote work? So, I think the churn we've had in the account management function over the years started because we couldn't pay enough to be competitive. Like mm. when we were small, like, you know, we started hiring account managers when we were less than a million dollars per year, we could only afford to pay like 30 to $35,000 per year. Right. And as we grew, we could, we could pay a little bit more, but once you've got two to three years of experience as an account manager at an agency, you can easily command 60 to 70 somewhere else. Um, so that was part of it, not being able to raise the, the rate or the, the compensation of the team quick enough to meet the opportunity that they could find somewhere else. Um, and, and the other is, you know, maybe in some cases hiring the wrong people. I think we've gotten a lot smarter about what the ideal psychological profile for an account manager is. Like at first we thought it was like more of a high eye personality and somebody that was very, you know, excited and really on the cutting edge with what's going on in digital marketing, um, which seems good, but that high eye personality type, that person that's maybe like more of a high quick start on Colby, if you're familiar, is going to like be in that position for six months, get a lot of great insights and want to be bored and move on to something else. Um, what we found is an account manager that's really more high on the follow through side of things, high, high, high on the fact find side of things and lower on quick start. You know, they're very diligent. They think things through. They're, they're, they're wanting to stay, you know, in a steady, consistent environment. Um, if you if you test for that in the, in the front end, you're going to have a much better retention of the account managers that you bring on board. Very interesting. Yeah, because I've I've been in meetings with like our vendors that have account managers that are just like these really ecstatic people. And it's it's with plumbing companies and these HVAC guys and 
they really just want somebody that says they're going to do what they say. You know what I mean? They want something with the follow through, which I completely, uh, completely agree with. Um, and, and, and like, what are your biggest like account manager, like things that they should be doing? Like what's, what's a, a key success to an account manager? So, I mean, the, the, the basic fundamentals, right? They need to be reaching out to all their clients at least three times for the monthly review. They should be conducting monthly reviews with at least 70% of their client bases. The KPI we're shooting for um, 100% of their clients should get a monthly review call um, video. It's like, hey, a recap if we couldn't meet live. Um, looking for the wins, like looking for, hey, you just got ranked for this keyword. Hey, you just got you know this extra review. Hey, you just moved up. And proactively dropping those communications of those wins in advance. Um, mm. And then always seeding the vision, right? Mm. I think one thing we've gotten better at is, is training our account managers, not just to report on last month, but to be talking about, hey, here's what's coming next. Here's what we're focused on over the next 60 to 90 days to match your goals. Um, mm. Really has an impact on, on retention. And that's the kind of thing you want your account manager to be doing. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to um, the not order taking, but giving strategy, you know? Yeah. And I, I really like that, that you mentioned the review call thing. Um, because sometimes like we, we'll miss a meeting and we won't really, we'll just send the report and like, we won't make a video kind of explaining some of the small wins because they have no idea. Right. Um, so you mentioned sales a little bit before a few questions here with your sales. Um, one is, are you ever going to expand into more verticals? That's I think a burning question. A lot of people ask. And then two, are your salespeople commissioned or are they salary plus commission? Yeah. And why? So, and why? so yeah, the, the, the sales team is salary plus commission, right? Base salary plus a percentage of, uh, of the first month. Um, our sales model is very inbound centric, which means we put out a lot of great content, prospects raise their hand and they schedule in. Um, so it's not like a hunter sales role. It's more of a, Hey, these people are ready. Take them through the sales process ask for the business. Um, so they get, they get a, a base salary plus a, a percentage of that first month. Not a lot, a lot of recurring. Uh, we did recurring in the past and that will bite you quickly. If you've got a fast growing agency, um, are we going to hop into another vertical? That that's a, that's a great question. I never thought we would really need to, right? I mean, I think that the, the opportunity within plumbing and HVAC is probably about $10 million per year, the way we're structured. Um, and the reason I say that we were structured is because we only work with one client in each major market. Um, so we've got one in Dallas and one in Texas, in Houston, and one in Miami, which is great, right? Because it creates scarcity. It creates urgency. It feels really good to the client that you're working with them exclusively. Uh, but there does come a point where you're like turning down five or six clients a week because there's somebody in a different, in a different market. Um, and so you can either choose to like break your promise and start like a fake side business and serve those clients, which I wouldn't want to do from an integrity perspective. Um, or I see agencies doing that. I do see agencies doing that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we've thought about it. We, we, we've thought about it, but you know, it's, it's, you know, everybody makes their decisions, like how, how they want to operate. Um, or, or like eventually you'd say, Hey, look, we've kind of run this, this vertical as far as you can go. And it's time to set up a, another one. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I think we've got about another, you know, $5 million in revenue to go. Um, but it's something we're, we've considered. So how do these other agencies get away with having several clients in the same marketplace? You know, I, if you don't make that promise of exclusivity, then you're not locked into that agreement. Um, mm. And I think if I were to, to go back right now and restart plumbing and HVAC SEO, I probably wouldn't do exclusivity, right? I mean, mm. it's the fact is, there's, comp there's competition that's going to be bidding on those key terms. It's going to be working to rank for those keywords. Um, and, you know, Scorpion probably has nine clients in every single market you know, across the country. And it's, uh, it's not slowing, it's not slowing them down. Mm. Yeah. I think, I think like I ask that question to a lot of people, right? A lot of the questions that I'm asking you, Josh, is I love comparing some of the differences in mindset. And uh, I think it really depends on the client. You know, like I have I have very intimate relationships with certain clients. They would not like me working with other people locally. Yeah, so I definitely sure. think you're you you have you, you're definitely right. Like that model that you have right now is the fastest way to grow when you start because it builds that loyalty with that business and it gives them confidence that they have something special. Um, and like talking about that, what's the best deal you've ever landed? Uh, best deal we've ever landed. 
Jeez, I got I to gotta think about that. Um, it's kind of hard because all your deals are pretty similar in what you sell. Oh, whale hunt. Yeah, we don't whale hunt all of that much. Um, and we haven't done excellent work, uh, you know, in complete transparency. We're not built to take on the, the big company with super complex situation. Like, we're built for this. Like, we know what to do, and this is our model, and we can just know that we knock that out of the park every time when we wind up with some bigger opportunity, which has happened over the years. Uh, for whatever reason, the model is not built for it, and we fumble those opportunities. Um, mm. So um, I can't say that we've had any, like, huge home run deals that have, you know, worked out, worked out well for us. Like, rotor rooter comes to you. Like, yes. what do you do? Super problematic. <laughs> Uh, we pass, unfortunately, right? <laughs> that's crazy. I, I think that that's so crazy because I think most agencies, like, they just get so excited. Like, certainly I would. And I would just be like, yeah, no, we, we, gonna, we do whatever you want. <laughs> right. And you're right. It causes a lot of issues. Um, do you, do, does Plumbing SEO work with franchises? We don't. Uh, we, we've had a couple that we've worked with independently over the years. Um, our sweet spot really is the independent plumbing HVAC business owner, you know, that we can, we can just take their whole thing and run with it. Usually when you get into the franchise world um, on an individual level, there's a, there's a national franchise website and you're very limited with what you could do. If you get the parent franchise, you're talking about a completely different business service that you have to deliver, right? They're looking for a national website with a national SEO strategy with national paid campaigns. Um, and you have to have the infrastructure and the, and the right strategy to be able to handle those, those opportunities. Man, that's just so much clarity because I think, um, like I said, people get excited, you know, Benjamin Franklin comes to you and you're just excited, but then you're like, okay, well, we're not set up for this. So it causes stress on you. Um, and you seem like you're maintaining good health and mental health. And that looks like it's a priority for you. So I can certainly understand that. Tell me about the worst deal you've ever landed. It's like the worst business relationship you've ever landed. Ooh. Oh man. Okay. So there, there's a couple, uh, I, I won't say the exact name of the company, but there's a company sure. we worked with in West Palm beach, Florida, some, some yeah. years back. And it was an individual guy and one truck operator had watched all my videos, had been in all my webinars, had sit in all my podcasts. So he felt like he knew me personally, Sure. came down and met with me in Miami to do business, which we never do. Like we do zoom based sales. And uh, anyways, came to the office Oh, you're going to change my life. I'm so excited. At the time, I think it was 1500 bucks a month, gave us the credit card and we did our thing, right? We did our thing. We you know, built the website, you know, did the SEO, started getting some rankings. Um, and one month in the guy's cool. Two months in, he's like, I'm not seeing any calls. What are you guys doing here? And, and he just went postal on us, like literally yelling, cursing, threatening, calling personal cell phones of me and my business partner, uh, physically showing up at the office and like threatening to burn down the building. Like this is one of these clients. You're just like, Oh man, like, please just go away. Right. <laughs> uh, and so we, I, I don't, I don't think we gave him his money back cause we actually did do a lot of work, but um, we were able to, to part ways. And those kind of clients will cause you stress will prevent you from going out and landing other clients, uh, having any peace about like what you're doing for the clients that you do knock it out of the park for. And uh, yeah, that, that fortunately we haven't had too many of him over the years. Do you know like what that company's revenue was? Like, do you think it was because you were this big line item on his credit card expense sheet and he was like, let me SEO, let me SEO. You just like thought of you so much. Do you think that that's why you have that? I will work. Almost the complete reason, right? If you wind up with, then that's why we stopped working with one man operators. If you're working with a one man operator, and I don't think he was even a hundred thousand dollars per year. So hey, for him, our payment was his house payment, right? And it's like, he can't afford to spend that money. Um, and, and we don't ever want to take money from someone that they can't afford to spend that money um, because their problem becomes your problem. You know, and it becomes very stressful for them, very stressful for you. Um, and so, yeah, protect yourself from those smaller situations. And that's so frustrating because you're just dealing with perception at that point. You know, it's like you can't even convince that client that you're doing the right thing and you're getting calls and you're getting chats, you're getting forums. It's just perception. And you just kind of, like you said, have to take the loss. Yeah. So um, you mentioned an interesting point about um, your personal brand. And I think that, like, I talked to Neil Patel, 
And um, he mentioned to me that if he could have done this all over again, which I think he was just saying this, I don't think he was being really honest, but if he could do this all over again, he probably would have just started a big corporation and not had any personal brand because of some of those relationship expectations when they do talk to you. Um, what are some like, what are some of the things that your personal brand has done for you? And what are some of the negative things that your personal brand has done for you? I think it's done a lot more good than, than harm, right? I think at the end of the day, people want to do business with people, right? They want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And people will pay a bigger premium because of who you are than because of what you do, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're the known celebrity in your vertical, in your space, and what you do, people will pay a very, very high premium to do business with you. Um, So I think being the face of the company, being the authentic Mm -hmm. person out on video in the webinars, in the field, makes you a lot more attractive to the clients that potentially want to do business with you. Uh, and, and everybody wants to do business with the known person and kind of have a line of communication to that person. So yeah, while you could set up an anonymous corporation and have salespeople and kind of be high, hidden behind the scenes, you're, you're not going to be nearly as attractive as a company to the prospects that you're trying to get, I, I don't think. I love that answer because I, 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 there's a really big company in Connecticut, um, uh, Connecticut Basement Systems, and the guy Larry Janeski, you should check him out. He has something called uh, School of Entrepreneurship for Contractors, insane business, right? But his face is on every single truck. So uh, I know a few people that work there, and they're always like, "Yeah, they want Larry, but they don't understand he's this big businessman, right? Like they think he's like the handyman coming to the house." So it's I like that answer. And it, it, it totally makes sense because um, it makes you more likable and, and more trustworthy. Um, and then uh, one last question here before we kind of go into some of the comments. Um, what was the best results you've gotten for a client and why do you feel those results happened? Oh, man. Lots of great results for clients. One, one of the best outcomes, I would say, is I'm trying to think. There's, there's a bunch. Um, one of the clients we worked with early is Shamrock Plumbing. He's a, he's a plumbing company in Orlando, Florida. And it, I, I think it was like a one or two man operation when we started working together. And we, we did our thing, website, SEO, pay-per-click, ranked you know, number one for almost all the keywords in Orlando, plumber, plumbing, drain cleaning, water heater repair, everything in between. Um, and you know he went from getting a handful of leads a month to 350, 400 leads every single month via the website. I uh, grew from that one man operation to like six over a two year window of time. Um, I think now he's got like five or six crews. And my last time I was looking at his call tracking report, like he's like over 800 leads tracked from our call tracking lines. Um, and, you know, it, it's a pretty, pretty significant result in, in that case. It feels real good. Um, and it's good. You know, we'd love to see those wins for our clients. And, What's different there than a client that gets like 50 leads? You know, it, it, you know, a lot of times depends upon the market, depends upon sometimes you do the same exact thing in one city and it just doesn't do the same thing in another city, right? You could do the same website, the same, you know, unique content strategy, the same like links and just for whatever reason, it doesn't hit the same way. Um, And so I don't want to say luck, but at some level, there's a little bit of luck. There's a little bit of that client being a little bit more persuasive, maybe with the way that they get reviews. Um, And, you know, sometimes just things line up really, really well uh, for the outcome of the client. Yeah, that's interesting. I've always found that that is just fascinating how people in certain areas just get better results. It's just all data science and local marketing and it's insane. Some people might search on the internet more in certain places and it, some right. people trust the newspaper more. So love it. All right, Josh, I know you're very busy. I'm just going to go through a couple comments here. Um, this is great, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I ha- I'm having a great time. I think it's a great episode. Uh, so Conversion Design is asking, do you like the hosting and maintenance model as a mandatory repl- requirement of onboarding a client? Yeah, I think if, if you're going to take over their website and you're going to build a new site on their domain, which is what we do, you have to maintain the website. You have to host it. Um, I also think results in today's market with SEO, with pay-per-click, um, site speed is mission critical. And so most hosts, you know, aren't getting green on green or on GT metrics. 
Um, and so taking control of that, you can control your own destiny from, a, from an outcome perspective for the client. Uh, plus, makes you more sticky, right? Because you've actually got control of that critical part of what you're doing um, for your main thing. And you can always drop down if the client's like, hey, I need to cancel. I'm going to a different direction. Uh, get some retainer-based revenue just to maintain the site and uh, maybe keep them plugged into a, a marketing automation platform. Yeah, guys, what Josh just said there is major key. So marketing services are different than website maintenance and hosting, right? So client comes to you and they say, look, uh, we're spending a lot in this. I want to redirect my budget to this. And it's something you don't do. Having that option to say, hey, no problem. We're going to manage your site. Well, you'll get access to it. You can self-host it. We'll still be here. And it's $3.99 a month. You still have that retainer. And Josh, I don't know if you're like us, but we love just people having our sites because it's marketing. It's a lot of marketing when somebody searches Orlando Plumber and they see Plumbing SEO at the bottom and it's just really good for you to have. So um, flawless answer. Um, so somebody's asking what content management system do you use? Uh, so we use high level, uh, the, you know, the, the go high level platform for our clients. Uh, we use it for a lot of our own marketing automation. Um, I'm a long time Infusionsoft snob as well. So I've still got some legacy stuff running for billing and stuff on Infusionsoft. Uh, but most of our sales and marketing and even client management sits in high level today. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and then, so do you use WP Engine for your hosting? Uh, we, we've used a bunch of different site hosts over the years. Right now, we use a service called Bionic WP uh, by uh, Michael Borgelt. Uh, what's nice about his hosting, it's not just the, the site speed. It's really the site speed optimization. Um, this for us was a big thorn in the side. Um, for a while, you talked about Scorpion. For a while, our site speed wasn't where it needed to be. Like we did everything we could. We optimized Nitro Pack and we did switch toasts like four or five times. And we just couldn't consistently get green on green on GT metrics. Um, and so Scorpion was just running those reports on our clients every single day. Hey, you don't have a good height site speed. What else is wrong with your stuff? And it was, it was an easy you know, thing to point to. Um, and so, you know, uh, Michael Borgelt is part of the, the seven figure agency community. And he said, look, not only can I, you know, guarantee green on green, here's why, right? And he's like, he do, they actually physically compress your images and compress the files and optimize on a weekly basis, which is what keeps the sites loading very quickly. Um, and so for about what you would pay through one of those other services, he'll actually also host it and do that optimization for you. Solved the problem completely. Like every one of our sites went to green on green and uh, totally eliminated that, um, that burden from us, which was huge. Got it. Great answer. Great answer. Yeah, it seems like Scorpion does a lot of the hunting there for plumbing specifically. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I give you kudos uh, being in that vertical. Like we will never focus on law. I just, that, that's something we will never focus on. We definitely <laughs> will not focus on plumbing. Yeah, plumbing, HVAC, and um, yeah, just not our not in our interest. Um, so someone said, I was in the seven-figure agency program run by Joel Kla Kaplan. Crazy how it's the same name. Not a question, but good comment. I'll, I'll um, add to that. I think Joel Kaplan's amazing. I, I'm awesome. a super fan of his. He and I both ran an organization, seven-figure agency. Mine, seven spelled out. His, seven. Um People ask which came first. Ours came first, right? You know, in, in like it was on no fault of his. He just didn't even think about the fact that somebody else might have already had it. Yeah. We had a great meeting, you know, mutual respect. Um, and I said, hey, look, you know, go ahead, man, use the name, you know. And I think he decided because I saw a video he posted to change the name. He was like, you know what? You know, Josh was here first. I think it's the right thing to do. And he changed it to, you know, digital lab or digital agency lab. But, um, but yeah, you know, that's, it's very true. There's the two, the two seven figure agency, you know, brands out there. Got it. Cool. Um, yeah. I don't know much about Joe Kaplan. Um, I just know he does um, like agency consulting. Uh, Chevy said, if you have a standard monthly retainer, how do you decide when to hire more staff? Is it revenue per employee or clients per employee, et cetera? What's your, what's your solution to that? Yeah. It's, it's typically, if you've got a fixed monthly fee um, and a fixed program that you're selling, you can base it on number of clients. So we know for every 20 clients, 25 clients, we're going to need to start looking at a new account manager retained. Um, and then for every 75 or so clients, we're probably going to need a new pay-per-click management person and a new SEO person to help structure the on-page and the content and everything else. Um, and so we can kind of know what those metrics are as we grow and scale while still keeping our gross margin in line and our profitability uh, dialed in. 
Interesting. Somebody asked, I think you already kind of touched on this, but maybe touch on it again. How involved are you in sales? Like, Josh, are there projects that you see come in that you're like, okay, like I want to talk to this customer or is everything that you're doing now going to your sales team? hundred percent to the, to the sales, to the sales team. Um, probably for the better part of, jeez, oh, for the better part of like three or four years. Um, I didn't want to let it go, but when I did, I was like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Like people schedule in, they meet with my sales team. They cl close the deal. I didn't have to touch it. Um, and what I find is when a client demands me on the front end, oh, I need to speak with Josh. And I, and I do that and I take them through the sales process. I'll close the deal every time. But then that client wants to talk with me six months in. They want to deal with me throughout the process, which isn't the ideal, right? You want that freedom, that time flexibility. And so I'm like, hey, look, if you can't work in our business model, you know, with the people that we have in place, probably not going to be a good fit. I'd rather just pass on the business than to have to step in and know that I'm going to get resucked into those situations. Love it, dude. That is so major key because um, initially when you're – committing to those things in the beginning, you're right. All of a sudden you're thinking about their calls and you're, they're emailing you out behind your client's back or behind your, your staff's back. And I definitely think that that's major. I love that separation there um, because it's very hard to do. Like there's just good accounts that want to talk to you. And so, you know, we're trying to get better at that. So I appreciate your uh, knowledge on that. Um, somebody asked, I think this is more of like a question for like your program. I, I don't know if you do stuff like this, but somebody asked if you could share your default click up template you use for each project. Is that type of stuff that you share inside of your seven figure we agency? Do, we do with the seven figure agency coaching and mentorship. We, we kind of give our whole, our whole stuff, you know, the whole process. Got it. Sounds good, man. Um, cool. And then Josh, um, before we hop off, um, looks like a lot of just comments are coming in. Um, before we hop off, anything that you wanted to leave with and kind of give the audience a little golden nugget? I mean, first of all, congratulations on creating this amazing YouTube channel and kind of what you're doing. You're, you're doing awesome stuff. And thanks for having me on. Um, I, I would say, you know, just if you're looking to grow your, your agency, simplify, right? You have to simplify to multiply. And I think a lot of us just want to make it more complex. Um, and so simplify, in my mind, is... Rather than trying to be like a generalist serving everybody, choose one niche, right? Rather than trying to figure out 19 ways to land clients, choose one way that you're going to land on a very consistent basis. Rather than selling a la carte services, here's the 19 different things we can sell. Dial in one program and sell that to that one niche again and again and again. You can really simplify your sales model, your delivery model, and your attention model, which gives you the ability to scale while still having the peace of mind and freedom you know, to, to live the life that you want. Hmm. Yeah. I think that what you said is like the fact that you would turn away roto rooter um, to keep it simplified. And cause like, that's a great client to say you've worked with. Right. But your goal really is that simplification to multiply. And I, there's so many agencies that have done such a good job with that. That's just a testimony to it. Um, one last question for you. When you were starting plumbing SEO, like what agencies were you looking at in terms of inspiration? Uh, for for SEO at the time, I, there were a couple a couple of you know national type type companies. I did look at Scorpion, right? I, I looked at what Scorpion was doing with law, and mm -hmm. I was I was like, man, they got these these law clients ranking. And I studied their their website structure and their title tags and their H ones, and um, you know that was one that I I looked at pretty closely as we were starting. Yeah, yeah, I think that's common with anybody that's doing agency. Eventually, you're going to come across. You know, now you're going to come across plumbing SEO sites, which is, you know, great job. Uh, but, you know, for legal, it's like definitely Scorpion. I mean, and then dental, you have like TNT Dental, which does a really good job in that vertical. Yeah. Um, so I, I love the verticalization idea. And then any one piece of advice for somebody who's generalist, maybe you could speak directly to me. <laughs> um, any piece of advice for somebody who's generalist that's looking to make that switch, but doesn't want to cancel their $1 million a year worth of business. Yeah, I would say don't cancel the 1 million per year. Find the vertical or verticals that you're crushing it in. Like you, I mean, if you've got a million dollar business or you've got a half a million dollar business right now, you have clients that you're working with. You have ones that you like better than others. And you've got a couple of really good case studies. I would say keep selling the way that you're selling. Don't turn that engine off. Create a new division for the company based on the one or two verticals that you feel really good about. Uh, and the way you do that, like, let's say you, you're, you've got a couple clients in dentistry that you've done great work for. 
you get those two to three clients, you create a great little case study. Here's the client. Here's where they were when we started. Here's where they're at today. Here's what we did from a strategy perspective. You make that prominent. Um, and either you set up you know, like developmark.com slash dentistry, or you set up like dental marketing pros, a division of developmark, and you just go after that industry, right? You start joining the associations. You start putting out content specifically for dentistry. Maybe you run some Facebook ads featuring those case studies and results that you've gotten. Um, and you test it out, right? Until you start to get some serious momentum, maybe you have like two or three that you consider. Um, but I promise you, once you land on one and you've got the case studies to back it up and you've got the model humming, um, your life can get a lot easier and your growth can be expedited. Amazing. Awesome, Josh. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, everybody, rewatch this video and take some of the notes. And if you want to go check out Josh, head over to sevenfigureagency.com with the seven, right? Not spelled out or is it spelled, spelled out? Spelled out. Seven. Sevenfigureagency.com. And uh, of course, I'll put the links in the comments and everything like that. So Josh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, man. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for watching, everybody. All right. Peace out, guys.